I had my CT angiogram done in Los Angeles with Dr. Matthew Budoff, a name that many of you will recognize. As many would expect at my age with my family history and prior lifestyle, and as I alluded to earlier, I did have some plaque. Was it a lot of plaque? Not really. It was described in the report from Dr. Matthew Budoff as minimal non-obstructive plaque. Specifically, the findings on the report read, and I quote, Findings. The left anterior descending coronary artery with mild disease, the left circumflex coronary artery and obtuse marginal branches are without disease, the right coronary artery, acute marginal vessels, posterior descending and posterior lateral branches are without disease, end quote. To get even more granular, we then had clearly an AI-powered software review the CT angiogram images and provide specific measurements of plaque. Results are on screen for those watching on YouTube, and I'll read them out too. In the left main and left anterior descending artery, the one that Budoff's report described as having mild disease, there was a total of 46.1 millimeters cubed of non-calcified plaque volume. In the right coronary artery, there was 6.8 millimeters cubed of total non-calcified plaque volume. And in the circumflex artery, 8.1 millimeters cubed of total non-calcified plaque volume. All other arteries scanned, including the first obtuse marginal, second obtuse marginal, first diagonal branch, right posterior descending branch, and the right posterior lateral branch were all clear with zero plaque observed. That means that my total non-calcified plaque volume measured across all of my coronary arteries with very sensitive software was 61 millimeters cubed. We'll come back to what this means in a bit. To put things into perspective here, while I would certainly rather have no plaque, the average plaque progression in the recent Keto CTA study that I covered, which used the same Clearly software to analyze CT angiogram data, was 31.5 millimeters cubed of plaque in a 12-month period for those following a ketogenic diet. So they were laying down on average, about half of the plaque that I've laid down across 39 years in a single year. Now, to better compare me to them, I would need to do a follow-up scan at 12 months to see how my rate of plaque progression looks. My percent atheroma volume, or PAV, another way of measuring plaque, was 1.8%. This suggests minimal atherosclerosis. There is some early plaque, but it occupies a very small proportion of my artery walls at this stage. In other words, the disease process has started, but we're catching it early at a stage that, as you'll hear later, may be reversible with the right interventions. For context, in the reversal trial, a statin study in patients with established heart disease, PAV values at baseline were 40% or more. So my 1.8% is low, but still meaningful. I also had a coronary artery calcium scan done and my coronary artery calcium score was four, indicating a small amount of calcium is deposited in my arteries, which really isn't too dissimilar to Peter Atiyah's score of six that he identified when he was 36. The CT angiogram analysis by Clearly also measures calcium, but gives you a better idea of the volume of calcium. And my total was 0.3 millimeters cubed, which I've been told is considered a trace amount of calcium. That's something that I'm going to follow up in a future episode with a cardiac imaging expert. Dr. Matt Budoff's report says that this score of four puts me in the 50th percentile for my gender and age, meaning that based on 30,000 persons scanned at Harbor UCLA, my coronary artery calcium score is average for my age. While this may seem reasonable given my lifestyle and my interest in living a long, healthy life, I'm not really interested in being average here. And based on other data sets like the 2024 one that I mentioned earlier, there's actually an argument to be made here that I could be closer to the 75th percentile for my age and gender. I'm sharing these scan results publicly, even though they aren't quote unquote perfect, because I think we need more real life transparency. It's very easy to post perfect numbers or just not share any personal health metrics. It's harder 
but more honest to share the full picture here, especially when you have a pretty sizable audience of people listening to your content. And quite frankly, I'm less interested in looking perfect and more interested in education and shifting the needle on my health and hopefully your health too. So with scan results in hand, I sent them to my buddy, Dr. Thomas Dayspring, and I recently asked him what his initial reaction was when reviewing them. Well, I saw you had coronary atherosclerosis. Was I shocked or surprised? No, not at my age. I've seen too many people over time. And, it, you know, those who have risk factors sooner or later are going to show some plaque. And I, I go back to my, uh, you know, my good buddy and colleague is Peter Atiyah. And he sort of did the same thing as you did a coronary calcium at a very young age. And it came back, I think, as a two. And it shocked the heck out of him. And, uh, you know, so I've learned from Peter, you, you just never know what to expect. If you've had some risk factors over decades, those ApoB particles have dumped cholesterol in your artery wall and plaque has developed. So I can't say I was shocked. I think your 10-year risk of an event is pr uh, an event, meaning what we call major adverse car coronary events, stroke, heart attack, bypass, angina, so acute coronary syndrome is pretty low. But uh, being a, a sort of a longevity plus health span guy right now, uh, you're 40, you're going to make it to 90 years old. So I would uh, not want that what you have in your arteries now to go untreated for the next uh, even 10 years. I'd want to arrest it right now to thinking way down the road that even at age 70, I'm like I said, just hit 79. I don't want to have a heart attack tomorrow. So uh, whatever risk factors are there, I'm going after. And we can go after risk factors a lot better now than we could when I was 40 years old, where we had very few things we could do. I was interested to know when atherosclerosis becomes cardiovascular disease by definition. While this is probably just semantics, it seems that it depends on who's asking, as explained by Dr. Dan so far here. Yeah, I always say it depends who's asking. So if somebody is, I'm talk, if I'm talking to a patient and they want to know if they have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, I say I'm not really comfortable calling it a disease, but I am comfortable saying you have atherosclerosis. Okay. Here we've identified it with this imaging test. But if, for example, I need to leverage a diagnostic code in order to help them get therapeutic that is limited based upon a diagnostic code, I'm willing to use that code more liberally to help my patient. So it depends who's asking. To date, I've spoken about these results with not only Dr. Thomas Dayspring, but also cardiologists Dr. Lawrence Sperling and Dr. Martha Galati and lipidologist Dr. Dan Sofa, all folks that are deeply experienced in preventive cardiology. The general consensus from my discussions with these folks is that most of the 61 millimeters cubed of soft plaque was likely laid down early in my life and then over the past 10 years, it slowed down with the lifestyle improvements that I've made meaning that my commitment to a healthy plant-based diet, exercising regularly, not smoking, etc., could only have helped, but that doesn't mean that it was enough. To understand the implications of my plaque volume, we need to talk about lifetime cholesterol exposure. We know the amount of plaque that we have in our artery walls is determined by our total cholesterol exposure over our entire life. It's similar to how the risk of lung cancer with smoking is evaluated by pack years, being the number of packs of cigarettes smoked per day by the number of years smoked. In the case of atherosclerosis, it's our level of LDL cholesterol or ApoB multiplied by the number of years at that exposure. For me, I've had 29 years of exposure at let's say an average of 125 milligrams per deciliter and then the past 10 years at an average of 80 milligrams per deciliter. So my total exposure in LDL cholesterol in milligrams per deciliter multiplied by years comes to 4,425 milligram years. This is a surrogate marker of cumulative cholesterol burden, which we know correlates well with total plaque laid down. So what exactly does that mean? To help explain this, I'm putting a graph on screen and in the show notes for those that are listening. From a review published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology titled Impact of Lipids on Cardiovascular Health by Brian Ferentz and colleagues. 
If you're listening on audio, don't stress, I will do my best to explain the graph and this concept as we go. This graph shows the rate at which plaque progresses at varying levels of LDL cholesterol over time. Specifically, it shows three different levels, 200, 125, and 80 milligrams per deciliter. And it shows when you convert from asymptomatic plaque, so having plaque in the artery wall without any symptoms, to being at increased risk of symptomatic cardiovascular disease. That threshold where you go from asymptomatic plaque progression to being at increased risk of a coronary event due to reduced blood flow to the heart is 5,000 milligram years. And this is actually a graph that I've had on my wall behind me for the better part of the last year. What's very evident is that the higher the LDL cholesterol, the less years it takes to go from asymptomatic plaque progression to risk of symptomatic cardiovascular disease in your life. People with an LDL cholesterol of 200, which is the red line, enter the symptomatic zone by age 20. People with an LDL cholesterol of 125, which is the blue line, enter the symptomatic zone by age 40. And people with an LDL cholesterol of 80 milligrams per deciliter enter the symptomatic zone by age 60. So I was tracking along on the blue line, 125 milligrams per deciliter for the first three decades of my life. And then I course corrected by shifting to a plant-based diet, begrudgingly letting go of steak, butter, cream, etc. Yes, I used to love those foods. And at that point, I got my LDL cholesterol down to 80 milligrams per deciliter, and my rate of plaque progression very likely slowed which I've marked on the graph in yellow for you to see. If you're listening, imagine it like this. For the first 29 years of my life, I was driving towards a cliff at 125 kilometers per hour. Then in my late 20s, I hit the brakes. Not a full stop, but I slow the vehicle down to about 80 kilometers per hour. So while I'm still moving in the same direction and I've already covered a lot of ground, I'm now progressing toward that cliff much more slowly. Today, I am further from the edge than I would have been had I never made a change to my lifestyle. Now, I didn't do a CT angiogram back then, so we can't know this for sure, but this graph and what we understand about lifetime LDL exposure strongly suggests that slowing down made a difference. And this is exactly why getting your LDL cholesterol down early in life is so important. If I could go back in time, I would have made lifestyle changes and considered lipid lowering medication far sooner. An interesting question is whether or not we can confirm that I have actually slowed down plaque progression with my shift to a plant-based diet. The only way to truly understand my rate of plaque progression is to have a follow-up scan. So we have two reference points, a baseline and then a follow-up, which may actually be on the cards. When it comes to gut health, I couldn't find a supplement that did it all. So I formulated one with gastroenterologist, Dr. Will Bolsowitz. It's called Daily Microbiome Nutrition or DMN by 38 Terra. And to our knowledge, it is the most complete prebiotic formula on the market today. We built DMN to support a healthy, diverse microbiome, which we now know plays a critical role in everything from digestion to immunity, metabolism, and even brain health. What sets DMN apart is that it contains clinically proven doses of ingredients like actazine and solanol, and it's a very concentrated source of polyphenols, all conveniently combined to nourish your gut bacteria and promote true microbial diversity. No artificial sweeteners, no gums or fillers, just science-backed plant-based ingredients in a once a day, incredibly delicious drink. So if you're looking to fuel your microbes and enjoy all the benefits that come with that, head to 38terra.com and use the code SIMON for 10% off. That's 38tera.com and use the code SIMON to feed those gut bugs. Mm -hmm.